Hello, Appleton Community Evangelical Free Church. My name is Desmond Van Houten, and I'm one of the elders here. I want to welcome all the people who are joining us online. Thank you for watching us. Uh, if you're a visitor, um, or if we just haven't heard from you in a while, just drop us a note at office at applefreechurch.org, and just let us know that you're out there and watching. Uh, we really appreciate it. I also want to let you know about a few of the things that we have going on and coming up with our church. On May 6th, it is the National Day of Prayer. Um, for that, we will have our sanctuary open uh, for you to come in and pray if you feel uh, led to come to the church to do so. Um, just a great time to be able to pray together across the, the nation for um, our church, the state, the nation, you know, just really our world. Uh, we also have a lunchtime coming up on May 16th uh, at the Pizza Ranch after church. Um, we have a community room set aside for us so we can just enjoy time eating and fellowshipping, just reconnecting with each other. And we're going to try to do this uh, for once a month. Um, so if you can't join us this time, uh, maybe you can the next time. Uh, ladies, you're invited to a morning fellowship uh, that includes food crafting, uh, homemade cards, and a testimony of a life changed by Christ. Uh, this will be held on Saturday, May 22nd from 9 to 1130. Uh, guests are welcome, but please RSVP by Tuesday, May 18th by letting Ruth know uh, in the church office. Uh, we also have continue to have our prayer warriors for Sunday mornings. Uh, there are still a few time slots between 9 and uh, 945 uh, with, for the women to sign up and just pray for various things related to the church body um, and pray for the upcoming service. We also have the women's Bible study. Um, they're studying everyday theology by Mary Wiley. Uh, two meeting times, Monday evenings at 6 p.m. and Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, just please let Ruth know in RSVP. Let me pray for the service. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, all that we can have going on. We just thank you for the ability to reconnect and that we can have um, online services for those who aren't able to make it. And we just pray for our nation that you would just be over us, watching over us, and that we would um, fall in line with your word and that we would um, just really reconnect to you and really lean on lean on you and lean into what you call us to how you call us to act I um, just pray for the service help the message to um, be able to penetrate us that we would be able to listen um, intently and uh, learn how you want us to behave and how you want us to live our life I just pray for everybody, um, the safety of everybody, as we um, continue to go through uh, this uh, COVID. I just pray that we would eventually all get to be back together um, as we start to near the end um, and get closer to just having more um, openness. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome back, everybody. It's time for our weekly uh, study in God's Word. And as I say that, I, I look for words every week, and you know, it just it comes out pretty much the same way. So uh, it's always great to come and be able to dig into God's Word. And today, I'm first of all, I want to want to mention next Sunday is Mother's Day, and rather than preach Daniel. Daniel 9 on Mother's Day. I'm going to take a week and we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a good time to do that on a special occasion like Mother's Day and recognize the fact that uh, we celebrate what Christ has done for us and we do that on a consistent basis. So next week, the Lord's Supper. Those that are watching online, please have grape juice and bread ready. I'll send out emails telling about that. And uh, then uh, we'll dig back into Daniel chapter 9 on the following week. And uh, I'm just going to say Daniel 9 and what follows that. Uh, that's going to be one of the most important sections we look at in the whole book of Daniel. And it's, it's so powerful. It is so uh, important because it, it teaches uh, future events in a, in a very profound way. I'm just going to say right now, I'll say this again possibly in the message, the book of Daniel is so accurate in its prophecy that the skeptics, they look at Daniel and they say, that book could not have been written in the 500s BC. They think it had to be written possibly even close to the birth of Christ because it is so accurate in what it teaches. And yet we know 
Jesus made reference to this. And if Jesus made reference to us, obviously, made reference to it, obviously, it is accurately true as far as prophetic literature is concerned. And we can know that. We can trust God's word. We know that. And it is so accurate. It is so much, there is so much detail there that tells us exactly what God's plan for the future. So, that's that. Uh, I made the mention about Lord's Supper next Sunday. Let's pray as we get started, and then we'll uh, study Daniel chapter 8. And I trust that this will be an encouraging time for us. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have of worship. We worship you because you deserve every bit of worship and praise we can possibly give. As I come before you in prayer, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who indwells my life, and dwells the life of everyone who's trusted in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the Spirit who empowers us and strengthens us. I thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sins and, and, and paid the debt that we owed. I praise you for that. I thank you for your consistent care, your, your faithfulness, for your goodness and your grace. I thank you, I thank you, Father. I pray now that you'll help as I try to communicate truths today that, um, well, we try to see the application for these truths for our lives, and we realize that this prophecy is not that easy for us to see uh, how it fits into what we do today. But help me to be able to communicate that well, Father. I pray for your help. I pray for your wisdom. I pray for your guidance. I pray that you'll guard my mind, guard my heart, guard my mouth in what I say, and help me to be able to communicate and teach truths that will encourage everyone that listens. It will strengthen our faith. It will strengthen our relationship with you. And I pray, Father, that this also strengthens our relationship one with another. So thank you. I praise you. I ask your help your touch upon this time, Father. I cannot do this without you. We cannot hear this without your help. So guide us, Father, help us. And I pray this in the wondrous, powerful, precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. You know, this week, President Biden made his first address before the joint sessions of Congress and uh, the joint session of Congress. And in that speech, I'm not going to make, this is not a political comment that I'm making now. He gave plans and preparations that he has, or that his administration has, for our country and for the world. Now, as people plan these things, we look at it, and some people got excited. Other people got concerned. And I'm not referring to anything in a personal way right now. I'm not saying that. I just want to say very explicitly, very clearly, that he can make all the speeches he wants to make. Former presidents made speeches. Future presidents will make speeches. Congress people make spe speeches. They're interviewed by the news. And people have a lot to say. But you want to know something? God's the one that ultimately has the say. And God's in charge. And we can hear all the polit political statements, we can hear all the different perspectives that news people have, and we should realize that, that God's Word teaches us something that is so important, and we can know what, um, what God wants from us by studying His Word. We can know what God plans for us by studying His Word. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to look and see what God has to say and ignore what the politicians, ignore what the news people say, ignore all of that because while, yes, it's good to know sometimes, sometimes we're overwhelmed by it, but yet I think it's important for us to realize God has the final say. And we're looking at Daniel, and Daniel is both a narrative book Verses one through or chapters one through six, narrative of the events that took place in Daniel's life, all the way from Daniel being taken captive to Daniel going to the lion's den to Daniel, chapter seven, receiving visions from God. Daniel in one through six, chapters one through six, he interpreted visions that other people had. He had God's help to interpret these visions. In chapter 7 through 12, Daniel received visions himself. 
but it's prophetic literature. Some people call this apocalyptic literature. In other words, that means that it's God's revelation to us that tells us something that he wants us to know. And there is help from God's word to interpret these things. We don't interpret these things on our own. We interpret these things from God's perspective and with God's help. God's word guides us. And we look at history at times and see God kept that promise. God said that and that happened. But we see Bible prophecy, biblical prophecy. What does it do? It gives us perspective. It gives us perspective about God's purpose, God's plans, and God's promises. And what we see there is that this is to challenge and change our personal priorities. It should challenge and change our personal priorities. We should see that I'm going to follow God's guidelines. I'm going to follow God's instructions. I'm going to see what God says. And I'm not going to listen to what some of the, the, the people around me think about all of it. I'm not going to listen to what the news people say. I'm not going to listen specifically to the promises that politicians make. Because politicians make promises, but they break promises. They're not able to fulfill them. A lot of times they're telling us things to get our vote. And again, I'm not making a political statement in that as much as I'm looking at truth. That's the reality of things. But biblical prophecy gives us, followers of Jesus Christ, gives us perspective. And we've seen over the last weeks where biblical prophecy is in fact a road map for us that leads to hope. I'm going to show some things in a little bit here that define why we should find hope in God's Word and in God's prophecies. I'm going to define some of that from what God's Word says. And biblical prophecy is a road map. It guides us to see how can I find hope for the future. And you know what? We live in a world today where hope is needed. We live in a world today where there's a lot of conflict, there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of confusion. There's a COVID. That's another issue. And people are looking for hope. God's prophecies, biblical prophecy, is a roadmap to hope. It's also a tremendous reminder for us of God's sovereign authority. We worship a God who's in charge. I'm going to conclude with applications that say we worship an almighty God who has a plan he has a purpose. He has promises that he has established. And we can know for sure that God is going to do what he says. But biblical prophecy is a roadmap to hope. It is a reminder of God's authority. And I want us to see, see that. I want us to know that. I want us to get that ingrained into our minds. Because I think it's important that we study God's prophecies. We study God's word and see what it says. I believe for the last numbers of years, people have ignored the biblical prophecies. People have pulled away from studying prophecy. I used to go to prophecy conferences when I was younger. When I was first in the pastorate, there were, there were prophecy conferences that I attended. And uh, these conferences, there'd be the, the places would be packed and you know what? Those places that had those conferences no longer hold them because people stopped becoming interested or stopped being interested. And, and I, it's, I think it's important that we realize God wants us to know what his prophecies teach us. He's revealed to us things that we ought to know. The secret things belong to God, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But the revealed things, the things that God tells us belong to us. And God wants us to take those things and understand them and believe them and trust in them so that we know that God's plans are perfect. We understand that. We can believe, Romans 8, 28, that God would bring all things to fit together, all things that happen fit together for his purposes, for his plans, for our good. And we can believe that because we study prophecy. Now, we saw the last couple of weeks in Daniel 7. I'm, I'm reviewing a little bit here, but I'm also pointing to something that we need to know. That before God establishes His promised kingdom on earth, that's a promise. The kingdom is coming. Jesus Christ will be king on earth. But before Jesus Christ can come to earth and be king, God must remove every hint of human government. 
That's why I say what politicians say, it's not that important all the time. It's not something that we can say, I bank on that. I can bank on what God's word says. And before God establishes his kingdom on earth with Christ as king, he's got to remove all human government, every hint of it, because God is going to rule. Jesus Christ is going to rule. And we come to Daniel chapter 8 today. Now we've seen Daniel 7 where he gives this, this panorama. This, this panoramic view of all the way from Daniel to the end of time. We have that panoramic view there. And we're, we've seen that God has a plan and purpose in place. Now something that I want to express, and I'm going to show this later, but I'll say it right now. It's interesting to note, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 through chapter 2 verse 3, Daniel wrote in the Hebrew language. And that suggests to us that Daniel was writing for the purpose of giving a message to his Jewish kinship, his, his, Jewish, his Jewish, uh, well, those that were Jewish like he was. And he was giving them a message. And it pertained to what Israel needed to understand. And we're going to look here in a little bit as we look and see. I'm going to show this in this first point. We're going to see where Isaiah and Jeremiah had a message for the Jewish people that they needed to hear, and they ignored it. And Daniel has this message for the Jewish people, and the question is, did they listen or not? Now, it's interesting, because then chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, through the end of chapter 7, where we finished last week, it was written in the Aramaic language. The, message, the language of the Chaldeans. And it was written in that language because it was pertaining to what God was doing in dealing with those Gentile, who at that time happened to be pagan, people. And what God was doing there. And then chapter 8 through chapter 12, once again written in Hebrew. Now that tells us that God has a message for his people Israel. And it's important that we understand that as we interpret Daniel. I'm going to go through more things like that in days ahead as we look at how these things relate to us and relate to what we understand from this. And some people say, well, I, I don't want that information. There are some that have said, Pastor, could you preach something other than prophecy? And I said, I've prayed over what I'm going to preach. I've asked God for wisdom and guidance, and I'm preaching God's word for us to see preaching God's prophetic word for us to see that God has authority. And God is going to fulfill certain promises that he's made. God has a plan. He has a purpose. He's made promises. And we need to recognize that. Now we see, as we look at Daniel chapter 8 and dig in there, we, we need to understand background information. Isaiah and Jeremiah warned Israel about God's discipline for their idolatry. They warned Israel about God's discipline for their idolatry. They worshipped idols. We could go back and see, and this is interesting to note this, Daniel wrote this in the 500s BC. Isaiah wrote 150 plus years before Isaiah wrote, he wrote in chapters 44 and 45, he wrote warnings about idolatry. He gave warnings about idolatry to the Hebrew nation. He also made promises in that those warnings said there's going to be judgment coming, there's going to be discipline coming. The warnings came but also in Isaiah's writings in chapter 44 and 45 of Isaiah, he gave a promise. He gave a promise that would identify Cyrus. Cyrus in Daniel chapter 8 didn't even exist yet. Daniel didn't know who Cyrus was. Daniel had no idea. And yet Daniel would come across Cyrus later in his prophetic ministry. But Isaiah wrote 150 years earlier that Cyrus would be king of Persia. And as king of Persia, he would release the Israelites from captivity. 
Now, Jeremiah also gave warnings. Jeremiah wrote closer to the time Jeremiah was still alive when Israel was taken into captivity. Jeremiah wrote in chapters 24, 25 through 29 of Jeremiah, he gave information about the exile. He told Israel, God has a plan in this, and he has hope for you in your future. That was to Israel. And he said, this exile is going to be lasting 70 years. He gave that explicitly. 70 years of exile. Now, that's prophetic. And it was exactly 70 years. And we can look at that. We'll look at that timeline later. Now, we look at other things, because Habakkuk, another prophet, who wrote close to the time, close to that time when, when, when Israel was taken into captivity, Habakkuk, a prophet of God, a man that loved God, he asked God, how long before you'll judge? He saw the idolatry. He saw the things going on in Israel. And he said, this isn't good. God, how long before you're going to judge? I'm a prophet. I've told Israel, the, I've warned them. How long is it going to be before you judge? God answered Habakkuk, said, I'll use Babylon to judge. I'll use Babylon to judge. Habakkuk was appalled at that. He didn't like that. And then he says, well, how can you use pagans to judge the Israelite nation? How can you use somebody that is worse than Israel in idolatry and pagan worship, how can you use somebody that's worse than Israel to judge them? How can you do that? And God's answer to Habakkuk is, the righteous live by faith in my justice system. The righteous live by faith in my justice system. The Apostle Paul used that same phrase in the book of Romans. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. Habakkuk, when are you going to judge, God? When are you going to do this? When are you going to bring this about? And, and God says, Babylon. I'm going to use Babylon. He did use Babylon. Habakkuk says, no, you can't use Babylon. You can't use somebody worse than Israel to judge them. But God says, hey, in my justice system, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. Faith in me. Faith that I know what I'm doing. Faith that I have a plan, a purpose, and promises that I make. Now, we have some details to help us decipher Daniel. Some things that help us understand. Daniel wrote in a specific way with a specific plan. He wrote the narrative first, chapters 1 through 6. He wrote the prophetic, chapters 7 through 12. There was a bit of prophetic in the, in the narrative. But now, Daniel 1 through chapter 2, 3, chapter 2, verse 3, was written in Hebrew, focusing on Israel, giving Israel a message. The Israelites could read that in their Hebrew language. Then Daniel expanded this, and he wrote a message, chapter 2, 4 through chapter 7, verse 28. He wrote in Aramaic, the Chaldean language, focusing on the pagans, giving them a message for them to hear. And then he wrote chapter 8, 1 through chapter 12, verse 13. He wrote in Hebrew again, focusing on Israel. Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew. Daniel wrote, God led him to wrote that, to, to let him, led him in how he wrote. He led him to write in this fashion. Now, more details for us to decipher Daniel, more details. First of all, the hope in the Hebrew language was for Israel to look ahead. Look ahead. Jeremiah wrote in the same way. Look ahead, Israel. God has promised that he's going to do something good for you later. You're going to be judged now. You're going to be, be disciplined now. But I've got plans for you. And I believe God still has a plan for Israel. Israel was involved in the crucifixion. The Israelite uh, leaders, the Jewish leaders, were involved in the crucifixion. Many people say, well, they killed Christ. They can't have a plan. No, God has a plan. Romans 9, 10, and 11 tell us clearly. The book of Revelation 
tells us very clearly. And you know, I want to say today, I'll say this now, I'm going to talk about this more in weeks to come. You cannot understand Daniel completely without looking in places at the book of Revelation. And you can't understand the book of Revelation completely without looking in places at the book of Daniel. But Daniel wrote, and he gave hope for Israel to look ahead. He gave hope for us. We have this. This is written to us for our benefit, for our strengthening of our faith. Hope for us to look back and see God's fulfilled promises. We can see how God has given details of exactly how he plans to work, what he's going to do, what he's going to fulfill. He promised the Messiah. He sent the Messiah. We know that. So hope for us to look ahead, to look back and see God's fulfilled promises. And then finally, hope for non-believers to recognize God's authority. Daniel wrote in that way. Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew. For Israel, for us, for the non-believers, to see that God's authority is for real. God is going to bring judgment. We saw that last week in Daniel chapter 7. God has plans and purposes for this world. Some of the things we can say, wow, that's a blessed hope. Other things we can say, wow, that is going to be terrorizing or terrifying for certain people. But now we come to Daniel chapter 8 and we find Daniel's vision. I'm going to read it piece by piece, explain it piece by piece, and then we'll draw some applications as we conclude. And this is, this is great stuff for us to look at and say, okay, Israel saw in this hope. They knew what was going to happen because Daniel recorded it. We see their hope because we know God fulfills his promises. Pagans or non-believers or those that don't understand what God's doing, they can look at this and say, wait a minute now. We see where we have a God who has great authority. We understand God's great authority. But now Daniel's second vision, and as I read this, You'll see what I'm going to say here. I'll bring this card back up again in a minute. He's going to talk about a ram that butts his head in different directions. A ram that symbolizes, well, it symbolizes Medo-Persia. That's the kingdom after Babylon. We look at Daniel chapter 2 and we see the division that Nebuchadnezzar had. We see the statue of the various kingdoms, the four kingdoms. We look at chapter 7, we see four kingdoms. First of all, the lion, Babylon. Secondly, the bear, Medo-Persia. Thirdly, the leopard, Greece. Fourthly, the terrifying beast that we can't describe. That's going to be the Roman Empire coming at two different times. And we see that. But now we come to Daniel chapter 8, and we read verse 1 and following. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king... A vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Uli Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there any one to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased, and he magnified himself." While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And a goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Now I'm going to stop there because I gave the first verse of the next section. But we, we saw there a ram with two horns. Now understand, horns, we saw this last week, the week before. We see it today. We'll see it in the future, too. Horns represent conquering rulers. Conquering rulers. And 
the ram had two horns. And we're told in the passage, later in the passage, we're told that the ram represented Medo-Persia. The Medo-Persia Empire, ruled by Darius, ruled by Cyrus. It represented them. And it says it butted one way, it butted another, and it said it was so powerful no one could stop it. And we know from what we read in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, that the beast, the second beast, the second part of the statue, or this particular vision that he had, the ram, representing Medo-Persia, that that defeated Babylon. Babylon was taken off the head of its, its, its power and was, 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 was removed. God's removing, removing human government. God is in charge. And, and, and it, it, it takes, you know, the ram removes Babylon. And the ram, the ram becomes the most powerful in the world. And it expanded its kingdom. It, re, it expanded the kingdom bigger than Babylon. It expanded it more. But now in Daniel's second vision, I read verse 5 before, or read verse 4 before, no, verse 5, I'm sorry. It says, and while I was observing the ram, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, sweeping down, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Conspicuous, a horn, one horn. The, the, the goat, they have two horns. This one only had one. That's what makes it so conspicuous. That's what makes it strange. I have a card here, and I'll raise it up and point to the fact that Daniel's second vision... Goat with one strange horn. And it destroyed the ram. And that goat, we see, was Alexander the Great. But let me read on. It says, He came up to the ram. It had two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him beside the ram... I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and its, in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven." So, explain a little bit. Got a card here to show. Daniel's second vision, it included, secondly, a goat with a conspicuous, a strange horn, one horn. And the ram destroyed, or the goat destroyed the ram. The goat, the first kingdom, Babylon, was destroyed by the second kingdom, Medo-Persia. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it was. Then thirdly, hey, uh, you know, a year ago I might have started over and says, oh, I made a big mistake. But you know what? You're used to my mistakes. I'm used to doing this. Um, the goat with one strange horn destroyed the ram. Medo-Persia was destroyed by the next, and the goat represented... Greece, the one horn, that single powerful horn, represented Alexander the Great. A, a conquering ruler, one horn, conquering ruler, Alexander the Great. And, and it expresses there that, that he magnified himself, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in his place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Now, let me just explain something here. First off, Alexander the Great was a mighty conqueror. He did great things in a very short period of time. He swiftly conquered the world. But at the age of 32, he died, number one, of an illness, but he also died of alcoholism. And he had no family. He had no sons, no wife, 
know anybody. And four generals, the four generals of Greece, took over the leadership and they divided the kingdom four ways. So Daniel's second vision, the goat with one strange horn magnified himself, but the horn was broken, Alexander the Great was broken, and four horns, four more horns grew. Four more horns grew. But then it says, verse 9, Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. That means Israel. Out of one horn, a small horn grew. This is not the same small horn we looked at last week. Horns represent conquering rulers. And a small horn came up out of one of the four horns, one of the four generals, one general took greater power. And it says, it grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. In other words, it began attacking God. It began attacking God's people. It began attacking the beautiful land, which was Israel. It began attacking there. And it, it conquered Israel. Now Israel, they'd gone back under Cyrus's rule, they'd gone back to the promised land years before. This was 200 years later. And Alexander the Great conquered. The four generals took over. One of the generals who happened to be Antiochus Epiphanes, that was his name, he conquered the land of Israel. And he says, it magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. In other words, it claimed the small horn became powerful. It claimed to be as great as God. It removed the sacrifice in the temple, and it threw truth down. Notice what the passage says. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down, and even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down, and... On account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Now it's interesting as we look at that, you know, it, 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 it took over Israel. It removed sacrifices from the temple which Israel had restored. And it threw truth down. In other words, it began rejecting and resisting everything that God stood for. And we read on, and it says, And I heard a holy one speaking, an angel, either Michael or Gabriel. And another holy one said to the particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. I want to read on. Let me read on, then I'll give more cards and explain, and we'll look at this more specifically. Then I, Daniel, had seen the vision, and I sought to understand it. Behold, standing before me was one of one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Uli, and I called out and said, Gabriel, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time toward the end. Now, while he was talking to me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, and he touched me and made me stand upright. 
And he said, Behold, I was going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Future. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. We already said that. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king, and we know that to be Alexander the Great. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from this nation, although not with his power. In other words, God is allowing that to happen. And it's not because of Alexander the Great. It's because these four kings divide the kingdom up and they take over. He goes on and says, In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors, transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree, and prosper and perform his will, and will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, and he will be broken without human agency. In other words, he will be broken without any man, any human being. Once again, God removes human government. The vision of the evenings and the mornings which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision, and there was none to explain it. In other words, the angels had left. He remembered. He understood what he was told before. But it was exhausting. It was terrifying. Now, Daniel's second vision, we go on and we explain, we see his second vision involved the four kings, but the one king, a small horn, rose up and became greater than the others, went to the beautiful land, went to Israel. That's Antiochus Epiphanes. This happened, we know, in the time of the Maccabees. And he did horrible things. He sacrificed a pig in the Holy of Holies. Just absolutely opposite anything that God would desire. And basically, uh, 2,300 days of terror. The angel said, how long? And it's going to be 2,300 days of terror. Okay, I've got a card that's in the copy machine. I won't be able to use that, obviously. But the seventh idea I was going to give here is that in this chapter, because it focuses on what happened, what was going to happen following Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, doesn't talk about the Roman Empire at all, but it talks about the little horn Antiochus Epiphanes, and he who desecrated the temple, sacrificed a hog, sacrificed a pig, had a luau in the temple. He desecrated the temple. He represents someone that will come in the future. And the angel tells Daniel that. A king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, not by his own power. He will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and holy people. Through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. He symbolizes the Antichrist that's coming in the future. It's symbolic of the Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphanes, years before the coming of, first coming of Christ, he desecrated the temple. The temple was restored. Jesus was in that very temple during his life. And in A.D. 70, years after Christ died, there was another besiege of, of Jerusalem. And we'll look at that in a future time, in, in another message. But yet, 
Daniel's getting visions here that are giving symbolic reference to future. And the Antichrist is pictured in this. The Antichrist is going to do horrible things. He's going to deceive with great intrigue and great mystery. He's going to take control over things. God's going to allow that to happen. Here, the angel said, all right, for 2,300 days, Antiochus Epiphanes, he had rule in Jerusalem for nearly six years. And then the Jewish people got the temple back. There's going to be designated times given to us in chapter 9, in chapter 10. Daniel's going to have specific times that he's going to be able to express. And we can trust that God's word is true. That God has a plan for the future. He has purposes that he will fulfill. He has promises that he has established and he will, he will keep his promises. So what do we draw as application? Well, I want us to realize that we worship an almighty God, God Almighty, our Father in heaven, who has established from the beginning of time until the end of time. He's established his plan. He's established his purpose. And he has established his promises. He established a plan that he would send a Savior. God knew that sin would take over. He knew what was going to happen. He was going to send a Messiah. He had a plan to send the Messiah. He had a purpose in sending the Messiah. He had promises that he made in sending the Messiah. Promises of Christ's first coming. Promises of his rapture, of when he comes to retrieve us. Promises of his second coming. God promised that certain things were going to happen in judgment. Certain things were going to happen in discipline. Certain things were going to happen in th throughout time. And as we look at this, God's, God's plan, we, we worship a, an almighty God who has established his plan, his purpose, his promises. He's established that for all time. And in that, we find there's going to be judgment, there's going to be justice, and that's going to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. God's plan, God's purpose, God's promises involve judgment. He judges sin. We saw last week, God is going to judge sin. He brings justice. We have justice by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If anyone's listening today and they've never trusted in Christ as personal Lord and Savior, let me explain to you. If you've never done that, judgment is coming and you will pay for your sins. Christ fulfilled justice, God's justice, by dying on the cross of Calvary for the sins of all those who trust in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished and Jesus is the one that provides, that fills, fulfills the ultimate promises. But as we look at God's plan, God's purpose, God's promises that involve justice or judgment, justice and Jesus, let's really realize God ultimately wants to fulfill by bringing purity, by bringing perfection, and by bringing peace on earth. That happens during the kingdom, during the eternal kingdom. The kingdom is going to be real. It's going to be something that happens on earth with Christ as king. And that's something that is future for us to believe, for us to trust, for us to have great hope. We have hope. We hold on to God's promises with expectation. We hold on to what God said he's going to do with great expectation. And we study prophecy because God says, I have a plan. I'm fulfilling my purpose. 
and I make promises in order to get that done. And ultimately, judgment will either be given to everyone who's never trusted in Jesus Christ, or judgment, there is no condemnation for those of us that are in Christ Jesus. We will have justice because Christ paid the price. Christ fulfilled God's justice system. And I, I, I beg you today, trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at Calvary. Jesus is the answer. And Jesus Christ provides for us purity. There's no condemnation. He provides perfection in the kingdom, in the future. And there's peace. Peace. I have peace with God today because of what Christ has done, but I have greater peace in days to come because God's going to remove all human, all human kingdoms are going to be gone. And Jesus Christ will be king, king almighty. And we look forward to that great day. I trust that that is, is hope for you. I trust that that is exciting. And I want to pray as I close. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you again. I, I, I over and over again thank you because you are powerful and almighty and you've made promises that you've kept. You've provided for us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that we might worship him, that we might honor him and glorify him by the lives we live. I pray that we might be your representatives, your witnesses to a world that needs to hear about Jesus. I pray today that you might strengthen our testimony and strengthen our witness for yourself. I thank you again for the truth of your word. I pray that as we look in the future, in the days ahead, look further at Daniel's prophecies, that we might find great strength, we might find great hope, we might find reasons more and more to worship and honor you. As I pray this prayer, Father, I pray for people that have special needs today, special concerns. I pray your blessing over those that are hurting, for those that are struggling with medical needs, for those that are struggling with other challenges. I pray your blessing. I pray that you might keep us, all of us, safe. Keep us strong in you. Safe spiritually, safe physically, safe mentally, safe emotionally, safe in every capacity that we have. Father, help us in that. I praise you for your truth, the truth of your word. Help us to live by your truth, Father, and also help us to live by your grace because it is so mighty and so powerful. It saves us, it sanctifies us, it strengthens us. So, Father, I thank you again, and I pray these things in the precious, powerful, mighty, saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next week, the Lord's Supper. We'll have a message, but we'll also celebrate the Lord's Supper together online. We'll celebrate it in person in our service, too. And I, I just thank you for watching. I thank you for your faithfulness. And I pray God's blessings upon every one of us. Thank you once again. Lord bless.